Why is marriage a sacrament? At first glance, the answer is not obvious, and indeed in the early church it was not considered one of the holy mysteries. The church started by blessing civil marriages, before eventually instituting its own marriage service. In the Gospel of John, Christ's first miracle is the turning of water into wine at the wedding in Cana. By this act, God blesses human marriage. Let us remind ourselves what a sacrament is, an outward expression of an inward grace. Marriage is a gift of God's grace. God gives us another human being to love and cherish, and pours out his grace on us throughout the marriage. It is God's grace which allows a marriage to prosper. In any marriage there will be difficulties, and without God's grace to sustain us, it may prove impossible. Marriage is a means to attract God's grace. It has been likened to the state of martyrdom. Through dying to our own selfish wants and placing the other person first, we can win God's grace. Martyrdom does not have to be a grand public act, death in the arena. It can consist of being the one to stay up late and wash the dishes. A selfless act of giving, asking nothing in return. In the Orthodox marriage service, the couple are given crowns. The crowns of martyrdom. A monk is obedient to the abbot. Likewise, in marriage, we can learn to be obedient to each other. This runs counter to the modern view of relationships, where we try to impose our will on the other. But holy obedience is not the obedience of the world. It is rooted in love for the other, not compulsion. It is light and joyful, not heavy. It seeks nothing in return, and does not calculate. The post-Christian man approaches marriage asking what benefits he can derive from the other. Their physical beauty, their charm, their sparkling wit. He enters marriage calculating what he will gain from it. The way of Christ is different. We ask what we can do for the other person, not what we can gain from them. As our Lord says, it is better to give than receive. The modern view of marriage explains why so many end in divorce. After some years, one no longer feels any benefit from the other person. We say, this is no longer working for me. We feel the other person has become boring or less physically attractive. We tell ourselves that we have outgrown the other or deserve better. Without God's help, and without understanding that self-sacrifice attracts his favour. Why would we stay married? Or indeed, how could we endure it? In the beginning, marriage feels light and easy. Everything flows well. We are always in sync with the other. But, as anyone who has been married for a long time will tell you, sometimes it can feel like being lost in a dark forest. You are exhausted from sleeplessness. The other person is just not hearing you. There are unkind words and tears. Their habits become unbearably irritating. This is the point where we need God. We turn to him in prayer and ask for his help. We examine what part we have played in the problem and ask for God's help in healing the rift. We ask God to put us in the place of the other and help us see their side. We strive to live the prayer of St Ephraim. Lord, grant me to see my own sins and not those of my brother. Suddenly the dark cloud passes and the light of God's grace appears from nowhere. We see the other as an icon of God, made in his image, God's unique gift to us. We feel profoundly grateful to the core of our being. If both parties see things this way, the marriage stands a good chance of working. But what if the other person does not respond? We must pray harder that God gives us the strength to endure. 
Often our prayer will begin to open the heart of the other person. God works invisibly in them. When human power fails, God's grace can bring healing. But sometimes even this does not work. If a person closes their heart, God does not force it open. For those who can bear it, even this situation can bring grace. Patient long-suffering is a form of martyrdom. Those who sow in tears will reap in joy. However, the Orthodox Church recognises that this is too much for many to bear. While it does not exactly permit divorce, it does recognise when it has occurred, and permits a second marriage, and even a third, but not a fourth. The Church recognises what was obvious to most until recently. Marriage is between a man and a woman, whose love is manifested in the begetting of beautiful beings. We participate in God's creation in a mystical way. Those who have been blessed to have children realise what an incredible gift they are from God. To see the mixture of the couple shining forth in the face of the baby. Truly a miracle beyond words. Many couples in their thirties have problems conceiving. What nobody told them is that the fertility of a woman declines markedly after the age of 35. Having spent much of their lives using contraception and even abortion to avoid having children, they are now unable to do so. This is what happens when sex is split apart from marriage. It becomes a recreational activity rather than a sacred act. It is ironic and sad. This is not God's way. So, the Church blesses and celebrates human love and marriage. St Gregory of Nyssa explains that they are a foretaste, a preparation for the love between God and man. If we had never loved a human, how could we begin to approach God's love? Through human love, we are prepared for divine love. Through a faithful marriage, we learn that true love involves sacrifice, patience, commitment, giving. We learn to bear with the barren times, knowing that true love conquers all in the end. As it is with human marriage, so it is with the journey towards God. St Gregory reads the Old Testament book, The Song of Solomon, as an allegory for our love of God. How beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful. Your eyes behind your veil are doves. Your hair is like a flock of goats descending from the hills of Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of sheep just shorn, coming up from the washing. Each has its twin. Not one of them is alone. Your lips are like a scarlet ribbon. Your mouth is lovely. Your temples behind your veil are like the halves of a pomegranate. Your neck is like the Tower of David, built with courses of stone. On it hang a thousand shields, all of them shields of warriors. Your breasts are like two young deer, like twin fawns of a gazelle that browse among the lilies, until the day breaks and the shadows flee. I will go to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of incense. You are altogether beautiful, my darling. There is no flaw in you. But then the lover disappears, just as sometimes we feel God is far away from us. My beloved, put his hand on the door latch. My heart began to pound for him. I arose to open for my beloved and my hands dripped with myrrh, my fingers with flowing myrrh on the handles of the bolt. I opened for my beloved, but my beloved had left. He was gone. My soul failed. I looked for him. But 
did not find him. When we feel far from God, we keep our faith in him, knowing that he is still working his grace inside us, invisibly. And so, St. Gregory teaches us about marriage. We celebrate it as a precious gift from God in its own right. But more than this, through a faithful marriage, God leads us towards himself. When a marriage goes well, it shows us what riches God has showered on us and moves us to ever greater love for him. When things are difficult, we remain faithful, knowing that through our selfless giving, our long-suffering, we attract God's grace. When human love is strong, it is a foretaste of God's love. When human love is imperfect, as it must be, we understand that only God's love is wholly pure. 